The 89th regular legislative session is over, and now that the dust has settled, it's time to take a look at some of the laws that will be coming into the fold and how they affect the lives of everyday Texans. I'm John Mondy, communications manager here at TBPF, and today I'm sitting down with my colleagues David Dunmoyer and Grayson Gee from TBPF's Better Tech for Tomorrow policy campaign, which deals with emerging technologies and tech policy within Texas, hoping to make the Lone Star State the leader in the technology space. David, Grayson, it's great to see you both. Thanks for having Good us on, Good to be John. with you, John. So y'all handle everything tech policy here at the foundation and there were certainly plenty of massive tech bills that became law this session so let's talk about the top bills you're excited to see coming into effect this year and we'll start with one of the big one of our big topics as a foundation uh, responsible artificial intelligence we saw uh, conservative model legislation on AI including the private sector AI bill House bill 149 uh, the public sector AI bill SB 1964 and a bill regarding protections from deep deep fakes SB 20 David I'll start with you kind of can you lay out the landscape for people of what we accomplished on the AI front this sure. session. Sure, absolutely. So top line, we made AI reform a top 10 LAA of the foundation this year. And the reason was we saw what happened with social media. Innovation is great, but when there aren't guardrails in place, there were kids who were literally committing suicide or dying as a consequence of these companies not being responsible actors, promoting the best interests of humanity. So working with lawmakers and really shout out to Representative Giovanni Capriglione, Senator Tan Parker and others, uh, Senator Schwartner being a big player in this, we started with a private sector AI bill, and it simply says, we are going to have pro-Texas, pro-innovation models within this bill, a sandbox that allows companies to come here, call the state home, and have a regulatory safe haven to innovate and develop. We have an AI council where we can learn, think doge, have the council hear from companies, what regulations are onerous, where can we re cut red tape, and where can we continue to grow with these technological companies? But crucially, that all hinges on the guardrail components that I spoke of. So very simply, AI systems that are intentionally designed to create child sex abuse material, incite violence for children, violate our constitutional rights, create a social scoring system, all that is expressly prohibited. And it's quite honestly a shame that we had to make that a priority, but we do. We see horror stories with companies like Character AI or even some newer models that are intentionally engineering products to be maximally addictive and harmful for kids. So we said on the private sector AI realm, what happened with social media will not happen with AI. We're going to show we can innovate and lead while having the guardrails to protect our most precious populations in Texas. Mm -hmm. Grayson, do you have anything to add on to that? Yes. So he talked a little bit about the private sector AI bill. Um, also, you had mentioned Senate Bill 20, which mm -hmm. was a, a bill that provided prosecutors with the tools to go after criminals that use our artificial technologies to modify images and create fake sexually explicit images um, for whatever purpose they may have, but it essentially provides prosecutors the tools to to go after those folks mm -hmm. and make sure that justice is enacted in that regard. Um, on the public sector side in the government sphere, Senate Bill 1964 was passed, uh, sponsored by Senator Parker and Representative Capriglione, um, which provides for government the opportunity and the means to enact the most dogeified reforms to government, I think, of any bill this session, because it equips state government with the tools to implement safely AI in everyday processes from taxation to just internal like data management and all those things, um, while also keeping the privacy and security of citizens data in mind. So it lays the structure for state government to use artificial intelligence, in, uh, improve efficiencies, um, decrease costs, and while all at the same time making sure that data is safe and secure. So that's the the legislature did a great job in attacking AI from both the private sector perspective mm -hmm. and the public sector perspective as well. Yeah, AI being such a broad kind of issue and thing, it seemed it's good that they took different approaches to really kind of shrink it down for people. Yeah. So kind of going back to what you said, David, about protecting children online, we had another big bill that passed, uh, SB 2420, the App Store Accountability Act by uh, Senator Paxton, mm -hmm. Representative Caroline Fairley. Can you kind of break down what uh, that bill did and kind of what it's how it's going to affect Texans and parents going forward. Sure. So uh, top line is this was a session of parent empowerment and the same applies to tech. The App Store Accountability Act recognizes that Apple and Google are the single choke point of the digital ecosystem. Why? They own and manage the app stores. The app stores are recognized as the marketplace that we access all the apps, whether it's Instagram, Snapchat and so on. 
And so this bill, now law, soon to be, prudently recognizes that they should be responsible for verifying the age of kids that are accessing the app store because that allows them entry into all manner of harmful content. And simply it says, parents, they already have their age uh, information. Parents are registered as the parent of a child and they, the parent, can approve or deny any apps the child wishes to download or any in-app purchases they wish to make. That's prong one. It addresses the conduct of multi-trillion dollar companies entering into contracts with minors in any other realm. That logic does not apply. We're simply comporting that logic in the brick and mortar 7-Eleven CVS landscape to the app store. Second, Mm -hmm. transparency. App developers currently have no obligation to make sure their app ratings are actually accurate. We do this with the Motion Picture Association, we do this with ESRB and video games, and it's worked well. This bill now says these app developers can't lie and say an app rated rated safe for kids four plus that's encouraging truth or dare, spicy purity test mode, this is a real app, can no longer be the regime. We're requiring that they're honest in working with the app stores and providing these ratings. So this is a huge win. Parents are empowered to have the knowledge and transparency into what their kids want to download and do as they see fit and manage their household the way they would in any other manner with technology now. Grayson, is there anything else there that you want to add on to that? Or think no, that I, I think that's a good a good assessment. I would just emphasize the point that he made because the legislature considered a wide variety of bills which would attempt to get at the issue of kids and the content that they see online. And one of the major benefits of Senate Bill 2420 is that it does focus specifically on contracts. Mm-hmm. So it's a content neutral piece of legislation that empowers parents to prohibit their child from entering into a legally binding contract with a multi-trillion dollar corporation. That concept in and of itself is easy enough for folks to understand, and it provides the framework from which then parents are able to approve or deny the various downloads that kids make on their phones, um, and ultimately provides the parents the the final say uh, in the in the content and the digital experience of their child. Yeah, I'm sure the parents of Texas are very grateful to have this new tool in their toolbox when it comes to parenting. That's right. Um, so, Grace, I'm going to kick to you now on uh, House Bill 2963 or the right to repair. I know this is in a very it's a very interesting issue, you know, it's, and it kind of is a simple issue when you think about it, but it's, you know, usually a lot more complex. So, Grace, if you want to break down what uh, HB 2963 does for people and kind of how it'll change their lives. Yeah, so the right to repair is a concept essentially rooted in the idea that when you own a product, it's yours. Mm -hmm. And as a fundamental component of ownership is the ability to repair that product that you own. And so what HB uh, 2963 does is provide Texans with the tools and equipment necessary to make repairs on the consumer electronic devices that they own. Mm -hmm. So the right to repair movement has a broad and long history um, covering everything from agricultural equipment to cars to um, all kinds of various devices, refrigerators, you name it. Mm -hmm. But this bill because of the fraught nature of the issue, the members chose to take a very tailored approach, specifically focusing solely on consumer electronics, since these devices that we carry around in our pockets every day are very prone to breaking, be it the screen, be it the battery going bad. And so what the objective was ultimately was to provide Texans with the parts and tools necessary to make those repairs for themselves, thus saving them time and also saving them money as it relates to the strict control that first party manufacturers have over the products that they Mm -hmm. sell. Say, so David, is there anything you want to add on top of that? Or I mean, he broke down the policy brilliantly. All I would add is, you know, somebody who, of course, is a user of consumer electronics, you know, I, I admired Grayson and others' great work and research on this, is learning that there is a vested, well-documented interest from these companies that they make products, they engineer them such that they don't last as long. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, they vertically control the entire repair process. So if you don't believe me, you probably do. Ask your grandma about the refrigerator she used to have. And she would say, the quip, they don't make them like we used to, and that is by design. And so this really hits at the core of what I think Texans and Americans feel intimately, which is we are enslaved in this digital garden and 2963, the right to repair, really takes the shackles off so you have freedom to make those repairs while also encouraging these companies to start making products that don't break intentionally. Yeah, 
definitely. Well, kind of parlaying off of the uh, personal, you know, digital devices and cell phones, another bill that helped pass was uh, House Bill 1481 by Representative Fairley on uh, personal device ban during school hours. Because mm-hmm. we've seen, you know, that as the digital age have grown, you know, kids have become more reliant on their phones. And for in schools, it's become a lot harder for teachers to do their job and get kids to pay yep. attention and educate them. Yep. So, David, I'd love to have you kind of break down what uh, that bill will do and kind of help it'll, how it'll help teachers and school districts going forward. Yeah, well, it's the the plea that parents, teachers, administrators are making, the kids aren't all right. And Jonathan Haidt says it's the anxious generation, and we agree fully that one of the single greatest sources of that ire, of that anxiety, of that depression, of that lack of focus in school is because kids are glued to their screens. And so what is a seemingly bold policy statement that was the norm 10 years ago is personal devices, your iPhone, your smartwatch, your personal tablet cannot be out during school. And that is so crucial because we've had teachers come here to TBPF, you've met with them, John, mm-hmm. Grace, and you've met with them, that were begging and pleading for the state to take action because outcomes will improve when we have educational choice. They will further be enhanced when we have teachers who finally can own the classroom again and have a wrapped, engaged audience. It is not the fault of the kids per se. It is companies that know that this will attract their attention away from learning meaningful skills that set them up for success. So I would argue taking phones out of school may be seen 15, 20 years from now as one of the single greatest indicators to why we see a ballooning of engagement and educational outcomes in Texas, because you're going to see learning environments transform in the state of Texas. I know a little shameless self-promotion. If you're interested in seeing how uh, school districts that have already kind of taken the steps to take schools out of uh, phones out of schools, I'd recommend watching our uh, episode of the Rebel Tech podcast with a uh, teacher and an administrator from different ISDs around Texas that have already kind of taken that step. The host was pretty good for that one. Yeah, he did yeah. all right. <laughs> uh, um, so kind of the last, you know, kind of big piece of legislation that we're going to touch on, you know, being here in Austin, we've seen, you know, the rise of these self-driving vehicles, you know, whether it be Waymo's, the newly launched Tesla robo taxis, you know, you kind of do a double take when you're walking, you see a car without a driver in it. Mm-hmm. So kind of, David, I'd love to kick to you, SB 2807, kind of a uh, bill to pass that was meant to kind of give, you know, guardrails for how these autonomous vehicles are meant to operate here in Texas. I'd love for you to break that down for us and kind of see what the, you know, the future of transportation in Texas sure. with these uh, vehicles is going to be like. Uh, absolutely. Well, the top line is uh, the future is all companies are coming to Texas to call it home. Texas has been a responsible leader in building out the framework for what a state-based AV policy solution looks like. And what happened this session was a continuation of those efforts. And really what it does is it recognizes we want Texas to innovate and lead with autonomous vehicle technology, but we're not going to give them preferential treatment outside of what us human drivers are required to do. So really, it says anything that a human driver is generally expected to adhere to with the rules of the road, autonomous vehicles so too must follow that. For example, there's a licensing requirement. They go through the DMV. Actually, it's a fast track DMV process to make sure they have all their ducks in a row before they're deploying their technology. There's law enforcement interaction plans. The idea that when I get pulled over for driving 25 miles an hour too fast and 35 southbound, I know how to interact with the law, uh, the, the, the officer of the law, and they know how to interact with me as well, which is an important point, that second point, because now we're saying these companies need to make clear to law enforcement hey, here's the process for dealing with if there's a car accident, if there's a car stopped in the middle of the road. And so really, it's just clarity and streamlining the rules of the road that apply to us, to autonomous vehicles, to ensure that Texans, who not all folks want to see them um, running roughshod over their streets, they have the certainty that they're not getting preferential treatment. And we can use that as a responsible tool to foster a better relationship between all parties involved as this technology explodes in the state. And thankfully, John, to to his point, this framework that's been established in Texas has provided a remarkable degree of certainty for these companies that are coming to Texas. You've mm-hmm. got Zooks, Waymo, now Tesla, as of as of recently. These companies realize that Texas is the best environment for a variety of factors, but now certainly because of the regulatory framework that's been put in place, they have certainty to know how to test, when to test, where to test, and it's creating an environment that is allowing Texas to lead in the autonomous vehicle space. 
It's good to have the, you know, responsible without stifling innovation, but still giving people Texans the freedom and liberty to, you know, operate their right. own vehicles and whatnot. Right. That's right. So, uh, David Grayson, thank you for everything you do for uh, Texans and kind of leading us through the digital age as we continue on. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. If you want to learn more about our Better Tech for Tomorrow campaign, visit TexasPolicy.com. Thank you very much. <laughs>